From there, we move into the design phase. And in design, this is where you really start to get the um, creative power of thinking about how we can solve the user's problems. And there might be many ways to do that. So coming up with ideas around how we uh, solve the user's problem in different ways and, and getting to that ideal design at the end of the day. Um, and we'll talk here about idea generation and how you do idea generation as well as uh, the tool of wireframing. Also, then you move into prototyping. Um, and we'll talk about different levels of prototypes and the value of starting small and growing momentum as you iterate through this process. And then testing, um, getting incremental tests as you move along, not just testing once you've built the whole thing. Uh, and so how do you test uh, internally and then with users as well so that you can validate that your product or your design ideas are working? And of course, this is an iterative process, and we will address how you start at the beginning and then how you can kind of grow and refine as you move along the iterations. So starting off with concept, uh, this is a part of the process where, once again, you're really trying to define what is the purpose of the product that I'm building. And so if everybody on the team doesn't understand some of the basic questions about what value is this going to bring to our users? Um, how will their life be improved? How is this different from other solutions out there on the market? It's very likely that you're going to create a product or a solution at the end of the day that isn't really that compelling to the market. So taking the time to really understand why you're building what you're building and making sure the whole team understands, not just the product owner. Um, can really make sure that everybody's driving towards that same vision. The next step of this is understanding who your users are. So in user experience design, we do a lot of user research. We'll go out and actually sit next to users, watching them use what they, they do today, um, kind of identifying trouble points, seeing them in their context. So you start to see things like, Okay, you know, this user is using my product while also answering the phone and getting interrupted by five people and whatever else is going on within their context. And so really doing research, understanding who your users are, their environment and their needs can help drive design decisions that you make later on. So for that very interrupted user, you might need to design the system in a way that they can leave their task in the middle of the task, come back and still have a clear status of what's going on because they've completely forgotten where they are in the steps. And so in user experience design, we call this process user research and then out of user research, we typically create something called personas. And personas are exemplar users. These are um, something that the, the development and design teams can use together to uh, discuss our users in a common format. So also part, moving into the definition phase, um, we really encourage all teams to use user stories. This is very common in agile development, and so most people who are doing agile development are very familiar with this format. But even if you aren't using agile development, the use of user stories can be very helpful so that you start to think about your requirements in users' terms. So why does a user actually want this feature? What's the reason behind it? And which user wants this feature? Maybe all of your user types need this feature. Maybe only one of them do. But having that discussion and truly understanding how it's going to be used at the end of the day can really help drive the design and what you implement. And you know, I caution you here because so many teams rush through the step. You want to start building, and I get it. Every, you know, we're all makers. We want to build it. But if you don't spend the time really forcing the teams to get to the level of detail that's needed here, it means that you're not all on the same page, and you're going to kind of end up with a disparate implementation. Also in the definition phase, another tool that we use in user experience design is user flows. Um, and once again, this is a step that a lot of people skip past uh, and go right to design. But the value here is that uh, by really thinking about your user flows, 
uh, you're going to start identifying some of those areas where you might have touch points between systems, either internally between your team or possibly even externally between other teams, other systems, websites that pass off to you. Could be a variety of things. And it really helps you understand the full path that the user's going to take and communicate with other teams potentially about what you, what you need from them and what they need from you in a more uh, consistent fashion. And that, at the end of the day, is going to produce a better experience for your users. So moving into the design phase, uh, this is the fun part from my perspective, right? This is what, what we love doing as designers. But uh, so this is where you, where you start off with divergent thinking. You really, how can we create something that is different, that is unique, that is um, maybe outside of the box? What is something that we could actually maybe use even as a um, competitive, you know, improvement upon what's in the industry so far. So really think outside the box here, come up with lots of different designs, get other people um, adding in their designs. If you're creating something just for your team, maybe get other team members who aren't thinking about it, also creating some designs, because through the divergent process, that's where you're really gonna get some new ideas and change the way that you think about the problem. But this has to be time bound, we can't just go create you know, all these different options forever. At some point, we have to decide on something and move forward. So uh, it needs to be time bound, and at some point, you're gonna start converging um, on a couple of ideas. And it doesn't mean that some of the ideas that you're not converging on are not good, um, and you might come back to those in the long run. But you wanna choose a few ideas that you think are useful and uh, might really be something that you can implement and uh, get good user feedback on and start moving towards implementation of those. So a tool that we use in the design process is called a wireframe. Uh, wireframes come in a lot of fidelities, so they can be very low fidelity, they can even be you know, sketches on paper, sketches on a napkin, who cares? Um, or they can go all the way up to being extremely high fidelity where it's actually a you know, pixel perfect sort of image of what the system's gonna look like when it's implemented. We highly encourage you to start very low fidelity at the beginning and only work towards higher fidelity as you're moving along um, those iterations. And by starting with low fidelity, what it means is that you're getting the basics, you're getting your basic ideas out there without getting caught up on the details. Um, and you can start testing those basic ideas and validating them before you commit too much time into it. So then you start moving into the prototyping phase. Once again, you want to you want to take this in an iterative manner. Um, how can you really start thinking about implementing this in the minimal way possible? And that actually might mean no code to start with. And actually, I encourage it to mean no code to start with. A best practice is actually to create something that um, you can put together in a day or less with no code to test with users um, first. So here's an example that we did actually with the UX team. Uh, we tested uh, the Red Hat storage da dashboard at the uh, Red Hat Summit in Boston last year. So we had gone through design iterations of the individual uh, graphs and, and metrics that you see here. So we are fairly confident about those, which is why they're pretty high fidelity. We had already iterated and gotten user feedback on the graphs themselves. What we weren't confident about is how storage users wanted these assembled onto their dashboard in a way that was uh, most compelling to them as users of the storage product. So we printed these all out and we allowed users to come up and actually to start moving them around and talking to us about them. And so this was no code, it was very simple to put together, and we got a lot of very interactive, good feedback from users that really impacted our design at the end of the day. Sorry, that's been crackling the whole time, huh? All right. Um, as you go through the iterations, uh, once again, you'll, you'll start increasing the fidelity, increasing the code, and working towards full UI development. And Serena will be talking to you a lot more about this phase, so I'm gonna 
continue on. And then testing. This is, this is the bread and butter right here. The more testing you can do, the more feedback that you can get from users, the better off you're going to be. So there's two uh, levels of testing that I wanted to point out. One level of testing is internal. It's really just saying, all right, we built something. Did it meet the criteria that we set out at the beginning? Does it actually meet that user story? Does it meet the user flow we defined? So make sure that you actually implemented what you talked about at the very beginning. Uh, so that's step one. And as you can see here, a lot of times this actually falls apart, especially in those handoffs uh, between different systems or different um, teams. And so it's really important to make sure that we, we do end-to-end -end test this, make sure it meets the user's flows as we expect it to meet them. If you get that basic check, then you can move on to usability testing. With usability testing, there's, um, once again, a variety of ways of doing this. You can do it from you know, taking your design down to the cube of somebody down the hall and just getting feedback that way. Uh, or you can go for full out usability testing that user experience professionals do. Okay. Um, and that's where we, you know, we'll do uh, the, the full out way of doing it is we have an actual usability lab. We bring in users, we watch what they're doing, we record what they're doing, and there's, it's quite timely. Um, what we do most often in the UXD team these days is actually remote usability testing. And this allows us access to a very wide audience, which is great. Um, and you can do this as well with your systems on your own. So you just set up a, a WebEx or a webinar type um, setup. You share your design. You hand the mouse access over to your user. You give them a few tasks to try out and see what happens, see how well they do. Yep. Okay. Um, can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so how does UX solve problems? So I guess the first thing that I want to make sure everybody understands is UX and UI are two different things, right? So UX is a user experience. So what does the user, how do they feel, how do they encounter the, the UI as they go through where the UI is actually the product itself? Um, UX is a number of different disciplines. It includes, you know, content strategy, information architecture, user research, interaction design, visual design, and usability. Um, and then if we wanted to break down interaction design a little bit more, um, the pieces that we focus on a lot, especially within Patternfly, are consistency, giving relevant instructions to what you're doing, uh, making sure the visuals are appealing and make sense, you know, color is used in their, the right circumstance at the right time. And also, uh, another one that's big is customization options, right? So users always like to customize their own environment. <clears throat> but where does Patternfly focus? For the most part, we focus on visual design, interaction design, and user research. So I'm going to go through that a little bit. But before I do, I'm just curious if you guys but can show your hands. How many of you know, have, have heard about Patternfly before? Oh, wow. OK. Um, how many of you guys are interaction designers? OK. And developers? I'm assuming the rest. OK, great. <laughs> <laughs> OK, excellent. Um, so you know, how do we go from either an, an existing product that might not look so um, current or from a, a wire, low fidelity wireframe to something more that's like on the right hand side? And we're promoting that you do that with Patternfly. So Patternfly is an open source project. We started it in the Red Hat UXD team um, probably in about 2013. But in 2014 was the first time that we um, put something in GitHub that was accessible for, from everybody. Um, it pr promotes design commonality and, and improved user experience across enter enterprise IT products. Our color scheme is essentially tested and built for that. Um, and as well as a lot of the newer components that we're putting inside of our pattern library lately. And if, if, if you guys are familiar with it, you'll see in the last three to six months, we've been adding a lot of dashboard components, et cetera. And that's going to be continuing um, in the future. Um, currently, we use it at Red Hat to unify the styling and behavior of all of our products. 
www.patternfly.org is our URL. I'm going to actually show you that a little bit later on. But first, I want to just talk about the goal of Patternfly. Um, again, promotes consistency and usability. It reduces cost and time to market. And the reason we say this is because there is, you know, proven design patterns in there. Some of them um, more complex than others. And oftentimes, many of them are also usability tested. So from an interaction design perspective, you can go find something there. It will explain why to use it, when to use it. But then you'll also have, for a coder, you can go and find the reference markup and pull that right into your application if you'd like to put uh, one of those design patterns into your app. It improves consistency within your own application if you're using the same component. Um, also, for it, if you're using Patternfly within uh, a, a portfolio of products, obviously it will also improve, improve consistency. And it in increases usability. It also allows the user, th the learnability is much quicker because it's consistent. So as I mentioned um, earlier, or asked a question about designers versus developers, the reason I asked is because we have two distinct areas. Um, one, we have a pattern library with usage guidelines, like I mentioned. We also have you know, color palettes, um, a set of icons. We, we include font awesome icons, but we also have some custom icons that are just for Patternfly. Uh, also talk about typography and where to use what styles when. We also give some guidance on terminology and wording as far as uh, you know, what, what sense and if you should use sentence style capitalization or that type of thing in different areas of the UI. Um, and then, as I mentioned for developers, there's reference markup and the Angular JS directives. So we have two flavors of Patternfly. We have a base Patternfly, uh, which I'm going to talk more extensively about. But then we also have an Angular version, which is a different flavor. Excuse me. So what is base pattern fly and what does it include? Um, it's essentially built on top of Bootstrap. And how many, I'm assuming, how many of you guys know Bootstrap? How about Bootstrap? OK, great. Um, we say it's pattern fly is Bootstrap plus extra love. The extra love is supposed to be you know, UX um, involvement, usability testing, as well as we have some additional components. So we've got uh, a number of Bootstrap. Um, extras that have been put on, as well as some jQuery um, components. We also, as I mentioned, included Font Awesome. And then we also have lately included C3 and D3 charts. I think we did that in the fall of 2015. And those all have you know, a pattern fly styling built on top of them. As I mentioned, we also have the Angular JS. Um, and there's a different repo for that. AngularJS was actually created a, as a grassroots uh, effort within another area of um, Red Hat. And then in the last six months, uh, our group has started to increase um, contributions to that as well. If anybody's interested, I'm the design architect of Patternfly. And there's a Leslie Hinson, who's also at Red Hat's product owner. Um, we're the ones who do you know, requirements gathering, data, Leslie does day-to-day -day management. I'm going to talk about the process a little bit as we uh, are using JIRA. Our board is, you know, completely public. Anybody can go there and see what we've got in the pipeline. We have two-week sprints, so we are currently publishing every two weeks a new release. Um, and our stories are very, you know, they're based on coming up with conceptual designs first. We blog about what we're talking about um, building. We look for the community to give us feedback. Uh, then we create a, a design, and we have the usage guidelines posted on the site. Then the next sprint, we create Marfin's markup, and then typically the next sprint is Angular. So you know we're, we're kind of in, in the same kind of cadence um, as far as getting things out incrementally. So this is pretty much I already talked about. So yeah, for the, the pattern library, which I'm going to show you a little bit, it show, I'll show you exactly where these things exist on the site. I just wanted to show you a couple of the um, different components. I mentioned some of the charting components we have. So uh, we, Catherine had actually showed you the testing that we had done at the Red Hat Summit. And what we were doing were a lot of our products were using different um, 
dashboards, and we were trying to look for common, common dashboard cards to use within the application. So we've come up with a couple of them. So you know, the, the one on the top is just a trend card, but the, it has the ability, especially in the Angular implementation, it has the ability to, to change some of the um, location of the percentage, or if you want to use a, an actual value versus a per percentage. Um, the one on the lower, the lower left is what we call aggregate status cards. It's essentially a, the ability to give you a count of how many objects are inside of, of your um, environment. And then maybe be able to show you either errors or object status of, of certain, a subset of those. And then the one on the right we call a utilization trend card because it's showing you the current utilization, the bar, or the arc is colored based on thresholds, so hypothetically, you would set a warning and an error threshold. So if it has not met a threshold yet, it's green. Once it's met a warning threshold, it's orange, and then goes to red if you hit the error. And then you, it also has an associated trend line for the, like the last 30 days or whatever you choose to have. And one of the other things I just wanted to focus on was the different view types. So currently we are supporting tables. We call this a list view, and then we also have card views coming up soon. Um, so there's there some of our various patterns. And the list view has been like really, uh, it's been getting a lot of attention actually in the community lately, lately asking as our reference markup is just getting released this week, so. All right, so I'm going to give a demo, but it's, n it's recorded. <laughs> Good thing I recorded it. <laughs> internet challenges. Yeah, we had internet challenges, <laughs> but I would have had worse challenges with my Mac, so. <laughs> Um, let's see here. No, that's not it. Oops. No. Uh, yeah, that's not. That's a file broker, right? This uh, one? Yeah. Uh, okay, sorry. There we go. Thank you. All right, so this is, I'm going to, this is essentially, what I'm, what I'm doing is using Bower to install Patternfly. I've created a new directory. It installs Patternfly. Um, and it was a little slow because I was doing it outside. Uh, <laughs> but once it installs Patternfly, what I'm going to show you is just how quickly it, it, it is to actually bring something in and build a quick app. Um, so I'm just showing you on the left-hand side, there's a directory called Bower Components. On the right-hand side, I'm touching an index.html, and I'm using VI, so excuse me for that. Um, I bring up the index.html. I go into Bower Components because there is a, underneath Bower Components pattern fly, there's a um, quick start file. And inside that quick start file, it tells you what you need to include into your HTML to just in, so that you can use pattern fly. And I'm going to grab that in a minute. There you go. Now I'm pulling everything in. Just because I didn't have time to pull out what I didn't need, but I'm just pulling everything in. And then what I'm going to do is bring up the Patternfly website. And once you go into Patternfly website, you can go into the Pattern Library. And within a lot of the elements in the Pattern Library, there's something that's called Reference Markup or a reference implementation, I forget what we call it right now. Yeah, reference markup, you can open that up. You have the associated code, so what I'm going to do is bring in those aggregate status cards right into my HTML. And then I'm going to bring up the browser, bring up that index.html in there. Oh, I typed in one line. <laughs> and then save it, and then bring it up on the left. And you can see how quick it is to bring something in. <laughs> Wait a minute. So there we go. There's the aggregate status cards. So then I decided to go back over to Patternfly, look at the utilization trend cards, where there's a, a row or a strip of three of them. You'll see below. Actually, that's the one, so I choose to go down to the three, and I pull out that reference markup, copy it again, <coughs> it takes 
obviously. <laughs> I thought it was much quicker. <laughs> so, and once we copy it, you'll see the, the result. So again, like this, this is great for two reasons, in my opinion. And one is, um, you know, for the code, it's great, but it's also good for prototyping, right? So you can say, take something that you see that exists inside of um, Patternfly and build something really quickly that might not have the back end working, but you can actually visually see it and see what it looks like um, and even get some interaction with it. So that's actually the end. I was going to try to do one more thing, but I am not going to do that. Um, now, what I'm going to do quickly is just show you Patternfly itself. And just go through some quick areas. You have 10 more, right? Yeah. Okay, so um, actually, I, I, I'm also going to say this is, this is the, the site design that's currently out there. We're also working on a, a pretty big site redesign um, that's going to be much more usable in the future, and I think people are going to like it more. It's going to be more focused on um, kind of delivering things for the designer. Um, designer and developer separately, where na right now it's, it's a little bit more convoluted. So if you go into, I'm going to show you the widgets area first. So in the widgets area is everything that we have that's either Bootstrap or jQuery or um, C3 and D3 charts. So you can see anything that we've done here and have the code associated with that. Um, so, so you can get the reference markup for forms there. And in the patterns area, this is more of the these are more patterns that we've created and designed specifically for specific um, use cases, I would say. So we've got different types of things for the dashboard. We also have different types of charts. We have something called an empty state. So if, you're, you know, if you have a table that when you start up the table of users, for instance, there are none that exist. So we have a pattern that, it would, would show that you could use that will say why there's no users and maybe allow you to um, hook up your main action to be able to create a user. Uh, we have things like inline notifications, toast notifications, um, all kinds of things like this. So again, with all associated reference markup that you can grab. Um, and then the other thing is we do have the Angular, currently we have our Angular documentation that's on a different URL, but there's also sample code for the Angular there as well. <coughs> now, what was it? Okay, thanks. Okay. So we do have monthly pattern fly meetings. So if anybody's interested in attending, we give a demo of what's happened in the last four weeks. We talk about what's coming up in the next sprints. Um, and people can give requirements or even talk about uh, being able to contribute. We'd love that. Um, and that's right now is the end of a presentation. I'm wondering if anybody has questions. No, yeah, we don't, not at this point. Could you please repeat I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah, do we have any plans for a wireframe tool that with drag and drop that would be integrated essentially with Patternfly is what you're asking. And no, we don't. We do have some templates for some of our low fidelity wireframe tools that we currently use. Um, it's. I think that's an interesting thing to it say. We could, way. we definitely could um, look at doing that. It is something that we have started building in some components for um, our, our team internally, either for low fidelity and for high fidelity for Photoshop. Um, so I think over time we could look at kind of putting those out through Patternfly. Yeah. Right now they're not, I would say they're probably not organized well enough <laughs> to we share, yeah. but I think we could get there. So that's great. Yeah, because we've done some with Balsamic, but we don't have anything that's with open source tools at this point either. Yeah. So thank you. Next question. Okay. Maybe the, the question is stupid, right? Uh, what you demonstrated was basically just putting some chunks of <coughs> blocks of HTML code and stuff like that into my own page or something like that. I can, I, 
Right. And uh, it would inject all the JavaScript you need into the pages, like that. Is this planned for Well, there's styles that are there's styles that are in a, a subdirectory, right? That you're referencing in some through some of that code, uh, and those are automatically updated, etc., with each release. Um, if you're t a lot of what Patternfly has, some of it's styling on top of existing Bootstrap and jQuery components, but others are like built-in components that we build in from scratch. So it depends on which ones you're talking about, really. Right. Well, so in, in in Angular, you would get those automatically. Uh, so we, like I said, we have two different flavors. So in Angular, you'd be using the directive, which would, is all encompassing. Uh, um, but based on what you're picking in base Patternfly, it might differ. So um, on the part of the uh, Red Hat that I concentrate on a lot, we do have a lot of teams who use um, Google Toolkit and other, other frameworks as well. And the, uh, the short answer is we don't have something for installed applications. We've concentrated on web applications. Um, we think that's where the most power is in the future for applications to live. Um, but there are a lot of teams who have taken the pattern fly styles and they can take um, the HTML, CSS from those and basically kind of refactor them for Google Toolkit or other frameworks. Um, we have not brought that work back into pattern fly at this point because we haven't done that in a standard way. Each of the teams have kind of done that uniquely based on how they've implemented it. And I think that's one of the challenges is there's so many toolkits out there that it, it's hard to standardize how we would do that. And, and that being said, though, I mean, it is open source. And we, you know, we had an Angular version created. So if people are interested in the community to contribute into something like that, you know, and there's enough interest, I think we'd be interested in, in taking contribu contributions like that as well. So I think we have two minutes left. I just want to say that we have a bunch of t-shirts and stickers if you guys want to grab them on the way out. And I don't know if there's any last question. So my question is maybe if you have similar. So in the Butterfly Angular project, uh, you can use uh, directives. So you can copy paste some small piece of code with some parameters, and uh, Angular makes the magic because uh, in your uh, samples there are um, long, uh, yeah. long code with uh, millions of bits and special classes. Uh, this is uh, which I can, I want to avoid. So the Butterfly Angular project makes it. I think, yeah. It's, I don't want to say it's easier, but <laughs> <laughs> it's a it's different context, right? I mean, this is, I think base Patternfly is easier for, for many applications to pull in. If you're using Angular, I think you should take a look at Angular Patternfly. Um, because it's more componentized. 
All right. Thank you very much. I'll try medium. Extra large. If you don't, oh, okay. Thanks. Great job. No. Connecting imaginary computers with imaginary networks. Bylo to imaginární celý? Bylo to celý imaginární. Bylo to v podstatě o shiftě. If you have room on your left or your right, please squeeze into the middle of the room so we can pack as many people as possible into the room. So we don't want any vacant seats here. Please ma ma make new friends and...